nevertheless, uh, without further ado, here's Stephen. Thanks so much, Adana. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, a huge thanks to everybody for uh, showing up, hanging out with me. I don't know exactly how many of you are there. Um, a little bit different than being there at Midwest uh, this time of year uh, for the big expo and doing a presentation face to face with everybody, which I absolutely love and miss. And um, but I'm super thankful for the folks at Midwest uh, Mountaineering uh, still carrying on with the expo and uh, the fashion that they're able to uh, mix to everything that's going on in uh, the world today. So um, this is new for me is my first real Zoom presentation and uh, uh, I'm lucky to have uh, Adon with me providing that uh, technical and emotional support. So I appreciate that. So thanks to him. Thanks to everyone at Midwest Mountaineering. Um, you know, if you look at uh, just about any uh, bucket list trip, um, any of the top destinations for adventure travel, um, list, Google any list you can. And most of the time, if not every single list you look at, you're going to find one trip that's included in that. And that's trek, the trek to Everest Base Camp. Um, it's an incredible trip that, you know, I can show pictures and I can talk about it, but it never does it justice. And uh, so I'm going to do my best to talk about it. I'm going to do my best to show you some of my uh, favorite photos I've taken um, over the years. Um, but the beautiful thing about the trek to Everest is you don't have to be a technical climber. You don't have to be an adventure nut. Um, it just about anybody can do this trip. And uh, if you're an adventure seeker, you just like uh, going on walks, um, avid hiker, uh, this is a non-technical trek that um, again, just about anybody can do. You're wearing a light day pack on your back uh, that just has a couple of maybe a layer, uh, your water, your, uh, your snacks, your camera, things like that. Everything else is carried uh, in a large duffel bag by a porter or a uh, beast of burden of one uh, sort or another, whether that's a yak or a zokio, uh, zokio being a crossbreed between a, uh, a yak and a cow. Uh, anyways, um, so this is non-technical and, uh, and there's like the, the name of the, uh, my presentation is a route for everyone. Um, no matter, you know, if you have time, then great. You can easily spend a month there or if you just have a week, uh, seven to 10 days, uh, you have options that you can visit the Everest region, explore the Everest region, uh, and experience the Sherpa, uh, the Buddhist culture, and the Himalayas that completely surround you um, on this trip. So um, again, my name is Steve Tickle. I'm a guide for Namaste Treks and Expeditions uh, based out of Kathmandu, Nepal. It's a very small uh, family-owned operated company by a gentleman by the name of Jangbu Sherpa. And uh, that's Jingbu there. And uh, I've been traveling to Nepal. This is my 19th year. And I've been working with Jingbu or using his company um, back in the early days uh, for logistical support. And um, now we've worked together for the last number of years. And uh, incredible, incredible human being. And uh, I always love uh, seeing his incredible smile, as you can see on this picture here. Uh, but uh, what brought me to Nepal the first time was I had, I, mean, I was an avid climber back in the day. And uh, I was looking for what was next for me. And for me, I've looking through climbing magazines in the very back, there was different trips and everything. And uh, I came across this advertisement for a trip to the Himalayas for a trek to Everest Base Camp, which included a, a trekking peak, which was, uh, uh, Island Peak, which is a 20,000 foot uh, peak uh, that was climbed. And uh, that was my first trip, fell in love with the place. It was, the, the Himalayas were the, the cherry on top, but it was the people that absolutely were amazing that drew me there. And meeting the right people at the right time, being the, at the right place at the right time, uh, got me back to Nepal uh, following year. And then my third trip to Nepal, I was co-leading a trip to Everest Base Camp. And it just took off from there. And, uh, and I've been very, very thankful um, to everybody involved. And, uh, and I've just uh, loved this, uh, this portion of my life so much. It's so much uh, fun to look forward to every time I go back there. And my true passion now is just taking people to Nepal. Um, so that's what we do. Where is Nepal, you ask? Well, if you don't happen to know, um, hopefully you can see my little pointer here. It's this tiny little sliver of a country right here, sandwiched right between China or Tibet to the north and India to the south. There's approximately 29 million people in uh, uh, the country of Nepal. 
And uh, about a million of that resides inside Kathmandu itself. And Kathmandu, I don't have my reading glasses on, so please bear with me. Uh, Kathmandu is over in this area right here. Uh, the Everest region right over here. It's about a 30 minute flight uh, between Kathmandu and the Everest region. Another very popular region is the Annapurnas over here in Western Nepal, about the same distance as far as flight goes. Um, but the Himalayas run the whole length of the northern border of Nepal, uh, so very mountainous, obviously. Uh, middle hills to the, uh, the center of uh, Nepal and to the south is completely different. It's an actual jungle region. And uh, so like uh, you can see in the cute little cartoons at the bottom, uh, they have tigers there and elephants and rhinoceros and things like that. So completely different from what you experience if you're uh, in northern Nepal in the Himalayas. But uh, going down to Chitwan, which is the jungle region, is an amazing trip in itself. Two, three, maybe four days uh, before, excuse me, before or after a trek um, is always a great extension to ex expand your time if you have that availability. Um, to travel into Nepal, you can see a completely different uh, climate down there. Zooming in even closer now, we're in the Kumbu region, which is the name, the local name for the Everest region. Uh, Kumbu uh, also has Sugamatha National Park, which is which this area is here, the majority, vast majority of it, uh, to include um, Everest region. As the, um, uh, the Everest region is out, itself is a national park. So um, this presentation, we're going to talk about um, the different options that you have. Again, a route for everybody. So um, your gold standard route going to Everest Base Camp. Um, and I'm going to, if you can follow my little cursor here. Now, keep in mind the blue color on this map is rivers. And we want to really kind of pay attention to the gold. Uh, I'm sorry, the silver gray color. Um, those are the different routes. So uh, looking up here, we got a few different major valleys that we can travel up, but the gold standard flying into Lukla, traveling up into Namshi Bazaar, hanging a right hand turn going up into the Kumbu Valley, right up through here, and all the way up into Everest Base Camp. That's kind of what I refer to as your gold standard route, and that's about a three week trip door to door. So leaving your house, uh, getting on that plane, going to Nepal until you walk back in your house. Uh, it's about three weeks. So um, from there, um, it's about the same if you want to do the what they call the high passes route. And there's a couple of different options there. Uh, Rinjala Pass is the first one. And again, some people go clockwise on this. Some people go clockwise. Um, I prefer clockwise, just a personal preference. Rinjala Pass over Chola Pass here. And that brings you right down into the, uh, again, the, the main route into Everest Base Camp or that gold standard route where you join that into base camp. You wanna add a third uh, pass on your way back down. Uh, you can go over Kongmala, which takes you into Chikung Valley over here. So flying into Lukla, and then we make our way into the, uh, up into Namshi, which is kind of considered the Sherpa capital. And then either up the Tammy Valley, Gokyo Valley, Kumbu Valley or the Chukung Valley. And we'll have, um, I'll be showing you some pictures of each of those um, as we go on. So first you got to get to Nepal, um, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, it's a good, you know, multi-day trip, uh, depending on the route that you take, uh, the airlines that you take, some are quick, some are slower. Um, but uh, about half an hour, 20 minutes to a half an hour, depending on how long they have you in a holding pattern to wait your turn to land in there. If you happen to be sitting on the lucky side of the plane, you'll have this view coming out uh, of your window or looking through your window. That is Mount Everest. It's a little bit, a bit of a grainy photo. I apologize for that, but it's zoomed in uh, quite a bit with uh, my older uh, cell phone camera. But that is Mount Everest. Um, of course, lots of clouds below. And then uh, this is Lhotse and Lhotse Shar. It's a sub peak of Lhotse right here. So you're looking at uh, the tallest peak in the world. You're also looking at the fourth highest peak, Lhotse, uh, located right there before you land right into uh, Kathmandu. Again, there's approximately 29 million people in Nepal and a million of those um, folks, and I'm just rounding off numbers for simplicity for me, of course, uh, a million of those people live in Kathmandu. And that's a very bustling city. Um, in, uh, about 80% of the people in uh, Nepal are Hindu, uh, 20, or I'm sorry, about 10% uh, are Buddhist, 
and the remainder are Christian, Sikh, Muslim, and so forth. Um, so very, very busy city, lots going on, lots of cars, lots of uh, motorcycles, lots of people walking around um, doing their thing, lots of street markets. When we go to, to uh, Nepal, I always like to have about two days uh, in Kathmandu just to kind of get our, uh, our bearings, uh, trying to catch up on a little bit of jet lag. So we spend a little bit of time in in Kathmandu exploring. I always in, invite and recommend that people go out and explore, get lost. You know, you always find your way back to the hotel, but uh, just explore the city. We also provide a, about a half day sightseeing trip, either before or typically after the trek uh, that we can see some of the more popular areas of the city. But it's an incredible place to hang out and look and just meet people from all over the world as well, because there's this is a bustling place for people around the world to come to uh, either the Everest region or Annapurna, Mustang regions as well. Uh, you see the religious monuments all over the place, uh, like the one that you've seen here, pagoda style um, uh, structure right there. Again, lots of uh, pedestrians and pedestrians never have the right of way in this country. So be very, very careful with all the cars. It's kind of a First come, first serve, or whoever's the most aggressive driver uh, gets to go first. So there's very few street lights uh, in, in the con or in the city of uh, Kathmandu. Uh, they seem to be getting a little bit better there, but uh, got to be really careful. But it's a beautiful, beautiful city as far as I can. I'm concerned. Um, very populated. Can be a bit polluted because of all the people. It is a third world country, but to me, Kathmandu is absolutely amazing and beautiful in its own right. Uh, in Kathmandu, uh, we stay in a beautiful hotel called the Yak and Yeti. It's just a short walk from a little area called Tamel, and that's kind of what they call the touristy district. Uh, lots of hotels there. Uh, this is a typical street in Tamel, and it's a bit of a maze getting through Tamel. All the streets are very small like this. They've gotten really good about closing down a lot of these roads to vehicles. So as you can see in this photo, people can kind of walk freely and not have to worry about cars honking their horns or getting ran over by a car or anything like that. So it's changed quite a bit. But within Tamel, you can you can essentially show up to, no, to Nepal and go for a full on Everest climbing expedition with nothing. And you can outfit yourself completely, whether you're climbing or trekking. Hundreds and hundreds of trekking and climbing stores, uh, internet cafes, lots of great restaurants. Uh, tattoo parlors, as you can see in the photo there as well. Lots of bars, um, live music. It's a great place to hang out, watch movies, things like that, and just do a lot of shopping. After we spend a couple of days in uh, Kathmandu, we're getting ready for a trip into uh, the Everest region. Now you can uh, the road to Everest is getting closer and closer, unfortunately, um, but they are constructing a road that uh, is a couple days away from uh, Lukla at this point. Um, but uh, so that's still a ways off. But uh, the vast majority of people are either hiking into Lukla, which is the, the starting point for your trek, um, or they're, they're flying, which is the, the vast majority of people are doing. Again, about a 30 minute flight, uh, approximately uh, flying into Lukla. Beautiful little airport. Um, some people have seen it on, I think it's Discovery Channel for the world's most dangerous airport. Um, it is a little bit crazy, but it's very thrilling. And uh, it's kind of that first, first point of adventure for a trek into the Everest region, but it's very, very beautiful. And uh, small planes, um, sits about 18 people. Um, and again, you can meet uh, people from all over the world on these flights, which is a lot of fun. Uh, there's no fancy TSA security doors on these planes. You, this photo was taken from the back uh, of the plane. I'm just zooming in right through the um, between the pilots uh, looking ahead. So you can watch the whole action unfold right in front of you. Look at there. You can see the airstrip of Lukla. Lukla, the airstrip actually sits in the far eastern edge of the, of the village. So the vast majority of the village sits um, uh, to the west of the airstrip that you see here. Um, the lodge that we typically stay at um, sits right over in here, which is great. We'll stay one night there on our way out. Uh, once we land in Lukla, we just stay for a short amount of time, get our porters in line. Uh, depending on the time we get there in the day, um, get some food, some tea, uh, and then get our make our way onto the trail, which is um, very, very exciting. So uh, that runway is approximately 1,700 feet long, sits at an angle of about 11%. 
grade. So it sits up like this and the pilots come down, transition and land uphill, which is, uh, I, from what I understand is very difficult for pilots, but they have to fly. Um, they don't have any fancy instrumentation. They have to be able to see the runway uh, in order to land. So if there's clouds, if there's crosswinds or anything like that, there's no flying. So it's adventure travel and you have to be ready for it. You have to um, be prepared that you could get turned around and head back to Kathmandu potentially. But uh, so uh, if there's clouds, there's no flying. And this is the starting point. This is kind of the hub of the Kumbu region. Um, this is where it all begins, uh, whether you're climbing Everest or climbing surrounding peaks or just trekking into the Everest region in itself. Um, everything is carried in there or flown into Lukla, like you see all the goods here in the foreground at the airport. Uh, everything has from this point has to be carried on the back of a porter or an animal uh, to all the homes to all the lodges throughout the Everest region so that's everything from beer to toilet paper to Pringles to Snickers everything food everything is, food that's not grown in the area of course um, is carried on the back of somebody so this is where lots of porters will migrate up during the trekking and climbing seasons and uh, look for work. And they may get hired either by an expedition, a trekking company like Namaste Treks, um, and or they might be just hired by lodge owners um, to carry their goods to their lodges. That could be right in Lukla, that could be all the way up in Gorak Shep, which is at 17,000 feet high, and that's the last uh, small village on the, the trail to Everest. So uh, they get paid for what they carry, how much they carry, and how far they carry it. Uh, so that's all deciphered um, once these goods fly. If there's empty spaces on the planes, they throw all these goods on there. And, uh, and then it's, I don't know exactly how the system works, but uh, porters are hired by the lodge owners for their goods. Here's a quick photo of a porter that's, uh, uh, these are boxes of rah-rah noodles, which is like, um, like cup of noodles type of thing, uh, top ramen, uh, those types of dry noodles that you uh, pour hot water in and hydrate. Uh, very, very popular meal in that region. So um, a little bit of a burden for him there, but it's probably not super heavy, but who knows how long he's carrying this for, we have no idea. So um, again, porters are uh, coming up into this region uh, to get jobs. Along the trail, the first day on the trail is down to a village called Facting. It's a short day, we actually go downhill, so we lose a little bit of elevation. Uh, Lukla sits at about 9,600 feet, and uh, uh, so we actually have an easy day, about three hours, maybe four, depending on how uh, fast or slow we're moving. Um, but all along uh, the trail, you see these incredible religious monuments. Uh, majority of uh, Sherpas are Buddhist, and uh, this is the land of the Sherpa. And uh, so all along, the, all, the, all along the way on the trails, you see um, all these Mani stones, which is the name for all these stones that you see, whether they're small tablets like you see there, or even the really large rock there, the majority of them are carved in. So if you ran your hand over it, you can see these and feel these uh, characters, which is the Buddhist mantra of compassion, O Mani Padme Hum. Um, and then some of them are kind of fancy like this, where they're actually painted as well. Um, same thing that you, uh, you'll you see uh, a little bit later on on like prayer wheels. Um, they're all embossed in metal uh, prayer wheels with the, again, the Buddhist mantra of compassion, O Mani Padme Hum, uh, embossed on, on those prayer wheels as well. Uh, this is Facting here, typical small Sherpa village along the trail, uh, tea house here in the foreground, the larger, um, taller buildings there are lodges. Uh, lodge owners typically will reside on the very top floor, uh, kitchens uh, on the on bottom to middle floors. Um, but this is the top, typical village that we stay in. The days of sleeping in tents are just about completely gone. There's a few companies out there that'll still uh, sleep in tents. But uh, honestly, we stopped sleeping in tents in 2008 uh, was the last time we did that. Uh, in the last decade, there's been lots of lodges that have been built, uh, which uh, creates business for people. Um, and uh, so you're staying in lodges, uh, staying in a, in a bed, sleeping on a bed, um, ordering uh, your food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner off of a menu. So you get to 
order and eat what sounds good for you at that particular time, which is a big change from what we used to have. And as far as uh, a big caravan of porters and Sherpas and cook staff, and we had to bring all of our food with us. And you were a bit at the mercy of the cook and what he was going to cook for you that day. And uh, it's all about bringing in calories on a trip like this. It's not a good time to try to go on a diet or lose pounds. Um, so, and as a lot of you probably know, as you get into higher elevation, you're going to lose your appetite. So uh, it, uh, it makes it very difficult when you want to bring these calories in. If somebody's cooking you food, that maybe doesn't sound so good to you. So it's been a nice change. Um, yeah, we've seen a loss of some jobs along the way due to that, which is unfortunate, but keeping people healthier, cleaner, um, and uh, full of calories now because they get to order, you know, what sounds too good to them along the way for each meal. It's been a, a huge improvement. Uh, the first two days, we crossed over seven of these sus suspension bridges, which is quite thrilling for some people. Some people don't look forward to it at all, but they're very, very strong. The cables on these things holding them up are extremely huge. They're, I don't know how they, I've never seen them install one of these before, but I would love to see how it's done. But uh, the Zocchios and uh, horses and mules that are carrying goods these days, uh, are crossing these same bridges. So they're extremely strong and it's quite thrilling uh, if you've never crossed over a suspension bridge like that before. Uh, again, I mentioned this is the Sergamatha National Park. So this is the park entrance. We're getting close to that um, now. Again, this is just another typical Sherpa village um, along the trail. Uh, again, tea houses, uh, the one to the uh, right right here is a little storefront you can't quite see it but all along the trail you can buy you know beverages water um you can buy snickers snacks cookies all along the trail so you really don't need to pack anything from home uh unless you have certain dietary needs but uh, you can show up without anything and you can really just kind of get your snacks along the trail as you pass through different villages uh, the peak in the background here is Kumbila. It's a sacred peak that watches over the valley uh, of the region forum and it's uh, not to be climbed. So it hasn't ever been climbed, but again, that's Kumbila. On day two of the trail, we work our way up into Namchi, that Sherpa capital of the region, uh, very bustling, bigger, uh, probably the, the biggest uh, village in the region. Uh, there's a bridge that you have to cross over to get to the what we call the Namshi Hill, uh, which is all uphill getting into Namshi. This is the newer bridge up here on top. The old one down below is still hanging in there, but everybody is uh, directed to the upper um, bridge these days. And that's uh, the shot across it. So got to kind of wait your turn every now and again. Got porters coming across. Uh, sometimes those uh, zokios or horses are going to come across as well. So sometimes you just got to pack your patience and, and kind of wait your turn. But um, it's very, very thrilling. This one's actually very, very high. And you can see the prayer flags um, that people tie on to it and with the different colors representing different elements of, of, the, of the world and the earth. And uh, kata scarves also people tie those scarves on that are, are typically given to people for safe uh, journey. Uh, when they say goodbye to someone's triples, we usually uh, present them to uh, clients or people they've gotten to know over the trip, and then they will tie them on here, which is a nice kind of effect as well. About two thirds of the way up uh, the climb on uh, the Namshi Hill, uh, if uh, the weather is good, which is typical for the fall when I like to travel there, you have your first view of Mount Everest. If you don't see it uh, on the flight into Lukla, uh, there's Mount Everest right there. So again, my favorite time to be there is in the fall. Statistically, these are the type of skies that you see there in the fall. Uh, crystal clear blue skies. Occasionally we get some clouds, uh, but it's fairly rare, uh, especially as we get higher. Uh, in the springtime, the climbing season, uh, the trails can be very busy with expeditions, things like that, uh, but also the weather can be a bit more unstable with uh, even rainfall and snow, uh, or it doesn't typically do that in the fall. It, it, it does happen, but it's not uh, nearly as often as uh, in the fall. So uh, this is the time of, that I like to go there um, because, well, you're there to see the Himalayas and uh, we want a, the best opportunity, the opportunity that we can get um, while we're there to see those big mountains. Uh, here's a very small snapshot of uh, Namshi. Namshi is home to about 1,200 uh, Sherpa. 
And um, it's in a beautiful amphitheater that's kind of built into this hillside. Uh, as you can tell here, I'll show a couple more pictures of it um, in its entirety. Uh, this is taken from my uh, bedroom at the lodge, the Alma de Blom Lodge that we stay at in Namshi. Beautiful lodge, incredible owners, very, very nice people. They treat us very, very well and have great food. Um, so I always look forward to going back and seeing them as well. Um, but all these buildings you see here are lodges. Um, we spend a, another a second day in Namshi for acclimatization. Uh, Namshi sits at 11,000 feet, so uh, we make our way in just two days up to 11,000 feet. That second day uh, is for acclimatization, rest, um, shopping. You can do lots of shopping here. You can go to bars here. You can watch movies here. Uh, the majority of those movies are climbing movies. They're not like the latest releases in Hollywood or anything like that. Um, but you can meet people, you know, from all around the world here as well. It's a lot of fun. Uh, great uh, artists there. You can buy paintings like the one you see behind me. Um, and then if people are feeling up to it, they're feeling well, they're feeling acclimated, we'll go for a day hike on that second day up to uh, 12,000 feet um, up to the Everest View Hotel. And I'll show a picture of that in just a minute, uh, just to acclimate and uh, use the climber's mantra of climb high, sleep low. So gaining that extra thousand feet and then going back down um, to rest, um, hydrate and uh, get more calories in us, do some shopping, stay the night in Namshi again uh, before we continue our trip um, towards Everest Base Camp. So this is looking down on uh, Namshi. Um, the villa, uh, the the hotel or lodge that I was taking a picture from is located right here. Hopefully, you can see my little cursor. Uh, that's the Yama de Balm, uh, Lodge right there. So that picture was taken looking this kind of direction here. But as you can see, it's in this uh, incredible natural amphitheater, terraced. Um, they grow lots of potatoes um, all through the Everest region. And uh, there's a school here as well. You can see that up in this area up here. There's also military base here as well. Uh, Sherpa Museum is located in this village as well. It's a great, great place uh, to spend an extra day. Sometimes we spend an extra day on the way down just to kind of depend on how our scheduling works. Um, and uh, it's rare that anybody complains about that because it's a great place to be. Uh, this is uh, heading outside of Namshi for that day hike up to the Everest View Hotel. It's, uh, it's pretty demanding. It's uh, pretty steep right off the get-go, um, but uh, slow and steady definitely wins the race here while uh, trekking in the Everest region. This is uh, the Everest View Hotel. It sits at about 12,000 feet, um, has a beautiful terrace out the back that has lots of uh, benches, bench seats that you can sit on make our way up there and look up the valley to where we're headed. So we kind of get a snapshot of where we're headed up the Kumbu Valley. Uh, have some tea, have some crackers, uh, relax, soak it in. Uh, see Mount Everest uh, like you're seeing here. Here's Everest right here. Again, Lhotse, Lhotse Shar. And this is the Lhotse Nupsi wall right here. That's a long ridge line that Everest actually sits back behind. Uh, and Tabushe um, Mountain, which is 21,000 feet um, off to the left there. Another little shop from inside Namshi there, lots of shopping. You can buy all kinds of knickknacks and uh, gifts for family and friends back home. One of those shorter treks that I was mentioning, the Kongdi, which is you go up into Namshi and then go up, uh, take a left instead of a right and go up to the Tami Valley, make your way up to Tami. And then you backtrack um, doing a climbing traverse. I say climbing, but it's just, again, it's walking, it's non-technical, but you're climbing up uh, to almost 14,000 feet. And this is looking down uh, from the hill behind Kongdi uh, to the lodge. There's two um, buildings there. And this looks straight up the Kumbu Valley of kind of where we're headed. And now you're looking down on Namshi. You see in the lower left-hand corner there, that's looking down on Namshi at 11,000 feet. Uh, Shengbushe, which is um, up in this area over here. And then that hike that we did at a Namshi up to the Everest View Hotel is that. That's your first part right there, climbing. Then it kind of eases up. And the Everest View Hotel sits right up there. Again, Everest over here, Lhotse. Uh, Alma de Blom, uh, 22,500 feet, uh, beautiful, beautiful peak off to the right here a little bit, uh, looking up uh, straight up the valley that we're heading up. 
or if you're just there for a short um, hike or shortened trek into Kongdi, uh, stay the night or two there, and then you'll make your way back down the hill uh, into Facting, the village that we stayed at at the first night, make your way back into Facting, and then the, the next day you back into Lukla and flying back out into Kathmandu, which is a great option uh, if you're there for a shortened trek. Another one is just going into Namchi and hiking up to that Everest View Hotel, staying there for a night or two, and then making your way back down. You can explore uh, for an afternoon up the Tammy Valley if you wanted to. Uh, see the sister uh, villages of Kundi and Kumjung. Kumjung is uh, one of the schools are there that uh, Sir Edmund Hillary built. He helped build like some 26 different schools in, uh, in Nepal. And, uh, and that's the location of one of, um, one of the Hillary schools. So Kumjung is always a highlight to see as well. So you can do a little bit of exploring uh, before you um, start your trek right back down to Fakting and Lukla for your trip back to Kathmandu. And that would be two of your more popular shorter treks. Up the Tammy Valley is a lot quieter if you're going to do like the high passes. Um, this is kind of where you uh, get your start or your finish, depending on if you're going clockwise or, or counterclockwise. Tammy Valley is a lot less traveled. It's um, really quiet. It's, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful village that uh, all you just kind of hear is the, the ringing of the bells that the, uh, the yaks wear around their necks. Um, the properties lines, as you can see here, are created with these rock um, rock walls. You can see the um, the path here and how it meanders throughout the village. Absolutely amazing, kind of Lord of the Rings ish feeling, I guess, if you will. Um, Going clockwise, we go um, a couple more nights up from Tammy and then uh, an early morning start um, for our first pass crossing, the Rinjala Pass uh, at 17,000 feet. Get up about uh, four or five o'clock in the morning, uh, hiking by headlamp because it's dark at that time. Get our early start and make our way up and over Rinjala Pass. A beautiful, beautiful, very adventurous pass. Again, at 17,000 feet high. This is looking up at that pass. If you look closely here, you can see some prayer flags uh, that are strewn across the pass right here. And you might be wondering, well, how the heck do you get up there? That looks pretty crazy or technical. It's not. It's the route actually goes like this and traverses across. Um, and that's looking up from that, uh, that other angle there. You can see that... Uh, Locals had may actually made stone steps here that kind of help you with uh, your climb up to the pass there. You can see in the, in the background there on, of Rinjala. And that's our view from Rinjala Pass. Again, 17,000 feet, great place to hang out and kind of soak up the view. This is personally one of my favorite views of Everest. As you can see, Everest dead center there. Um, absolutely beautiful. It just looks stunning. Um, and you make your way. If you look really closely, once we make our descent, we're, this is where we're headed the, the next or the day after we cross over Rangela. This is Gokyo. So this is the Gokyo Valley. This is the small little village of Gokyo. They have Gokyo Lakes. So there's like three different lakes. Uh, but that's the little village that we're heading at. This is Zompa Glacier right here. If you're going over the Chola Pass as well, uh, or the second pass is you have to cross over this glacier. Uh, again, non-technical, super safe. Uh, don't have to be roped up or anything like that. Cross over this glacier, and then you uh, climb up and make your approach for the Chola Pass. Essentially the same view over the Chola Pass. Of course, you are a little bit closer to Mount Everest at that point, uh, but essentially the exact same point of view that you're looking at. Again, this is uh, now we're down in uh, Gokyo. A small village, um, just a, a small number of uh, lodges here. If you look at the very end of the valley, that's Choyu, or the sixth highest mountain in the world. And then that big uh, dirt mound, <laughs> dirt mountain behind, uh, or in front of Gokyo right here, you can actually see the trail. This is Gokyo Ri. And it's approximately 17,000 feet high. It's a great day hike. So it's always good to spend an extra day in Gokyo. Uh, some people do, some people don't. But if you do uh, a hike up to Gokyo, um, essentially affords you the same view, uh, view that we had from Rinjala Pass. Uh, but uh, the climb up there to its summit is a, a, a fun feat and uh, a great accomplishment, accomplishment in itself 
So again, has a great view and just takes a, a short afternoon of a couple hours to do that. Making our way towards the Chola Pass, we need to get across the Zampa Glacier, which is the largest glacier in Nepal. Looks like just a lot of dirt and rock and everything, but that's actually glacier. So a glacier is like a rototiller that's pushing its way constantly down the valley, um, constantly churning up dirt and rock from the lateral moraines or the sides of the valley, dumping that rock and dirt back on itself. And it kind of makes its way over and covers up all of that glacial ice and snow. But if you were to dig underneath that, um, you would find uh, glacial ice and snow because that is a true moving uh, glacier uh, that's pushing itself down the valley. If you look closely down here, you can see a couple of trekkers uh, right down in here uh, to kind of give you a, uh, an idea of the size of it. It's a huge glacier. And again, it's non-technical to cross it. We're gonna, we cross over and make our way over here and behind this ridge line here uh, to uh, go up and over the uh, Chola Pass. And this is Cholatsi, 21,000 feet high another beautiful Himalayan peak in the area. And that's looking to, uh, towards Chola Pass. Again, it's about 17,000 feet. So you're crossing over two passes at 17,000 feet. That's just below uh, Chola right there. Same type of uh, kind of uh, non-technical climbing. You don't need to use your hands or anything like that. It's just one foot in front of the other. Slow and steady again, always win the, wins the race in uh, the Himalayas. And this is uh, the top of Chola Pass, lots of prayer flags. Uh, people like, like to spend their time here and uh, soak up the views from both directions, from where you came and where you're headed. And leaving Chola Pass, uh, sometimes uh, we like, we encourage people to bring like the yak tracks uh, for the bottom bottoms of your shoes. You don't need to cramp ons or anything like that, but it's a good piece of gear to have with you. Uh, sometimes it can be kind of icy and a little bit treacherous. Uh, but uh, for the most part, usually in the fall, it's just uh, as you see here, um, the trail is well maintained, uh, well traveled, so not too much ice or snow that you have to worry about um, crossing on. And to make our way back down from this point, making our way back down to the Kumbu Valley, which is again going back to that uh, gold standard route, as I like to call it. We're going to meet up with uh, everybody else that's coming up that gold uh, standard route. Uh, uh, Farishe, it's 14,000 feet, sits down in here. If we go up that standard route, we'll stay at Farishe for an extra day. It's at 14,000 feet high. Um, it's, a, it's a small village, not a whole lot to do there. There's not a lot of shops or anything uh, to do there. So it's a great place to rest though. Um, there's not a, much internet or any cell phone signals whatsoever in that valley. Um, but if people are feeling good, um, again, for that acclimatization day, I always encourage people to go up and again, use that climber's mantra of climb high, sleep low. So just do a small hike up to, um, you know, gain another thousand feet before coming back down, resting for the rest of the day and sleeping there before we move on uh, to higher elevations. Lots of options uh, in this area at a fair shade for uh, day hikes, which is great. Uh, on the third, if you choose to do a third pass um, or even uh, going up the gold standard route, some people don't stay in Farishay, some people stay in uh, the village of Dingbushe. This is looking down from the ridge line that separates Farishe and Dingbushe. This is um, uh, looking down on Dingbushe, and this is in the Chukung Valley. So at the very end of that valley, you see, you can see Island Peak, which is this peak right here. Very, very popular, what they call trekking peak. Um, it's technical, it's a technical climb. It's the same uh, size as Denali or Mount McKinley in Alaska. So 20,300 feet high. Uh, in order to climb this peak, you just continue up the valley to the end of it, make your way around to the right side of it, to the back of it. And then you have a high camp and you climb up and you're back down. And within that same day, you can make your way all the way back into either Chikung uh, or a really long day back down into Dingbushe. Um, but to, uh, to add a, a, a climb into um, Island Peak, it's really a couple of days, two, three days um, is all you need to add on to your itinerary. If that's something that you wanted to do as far as climbing a Himalayan peak, um, add it on to your trek um, to Everest Base Camp. The Kongmala Pass is that third pass that, uh, or first pass, again, depending on which direction that you're going or traveling in. 
this could be that first or, or last pass. Uh, the Kongmala, this is looking uh, down towards the Chukung Valley. Again, Island Peak would be to the left if we were able to pan this photo to the left. That's where we'd be seeing Island Peak. So great, incredible advantage point. And then if I was to turn around and look from the opposite direction, we'd be looking down into the Kumbu Glacier, which runs off of uh, Mount Everest. This is Lobache. This village sits at 16,000 feet. This is one of our stops um, on the way. And uh, again, not a lot of shopping or anything to do here. You're just staying here typically one night, uh, making our way up. We just have one more day on the trail to Everest Base Camp and before we're making our way back home. So just a few lodges here. It's gotten bigger over the years. Um, uh, but again, it's just for rest for one night. If we pan to the right, this is going to be the lateral moraine of the Kumbu Glacier um, coming off of Mount Everest. And that peak peeking over the, the ridge line in front of us is Pomore, which it sits at 23,000 feet. Making our way into uh, Gorik Shep, which is that last village along the, the uh, trail to Everest Base Camp. You can't quite see it, but it just sits right outside of your view down below this little ridge line right here. This is the Kumbu Glacier to the right. Again, lots of dirt and rock that gets tumbled up on top of itself as that glacial glacier moves and bulldozes its way down the valley. And here you can see a little bit uh, better view of some of that glacial ice and snow that's peaking from underneath all that dirt and rock. The very end of this valley here is the um, is base camp, the Everest base camp. Uh, it's Kumbu Glacier coming down off of Mount Everest. Uh, this is the west shoulder of Mount Everest over here to the right. This is Chengxi, which is actually in Tibet. This whole ridge line here that we're looking at here is the border between Nepal and Tibet. And again, Pomori, 23,000 feet um, tall over here. And we're just about a uh, short amount of time away from Gorik Shep. And there it is right there. Very, very small village, only occupied during the climbing and trekking seasons in the spring and fall. And uh, so just a few lodges there. And again, base camp all the way down here. This is approximately two, maybe three hours walking from Gorkshep to base camp. So again, depending on your pace, um, it can take you as you know quickly as about two hours. And some people like to take their time, which is awesome. and can get there in about three hours. This time of year, it's a ghost town. So there's no uh, real climbing. Occasionally, I've seen the Koreans are there. They have a camp set up at base camp to climb Everest in, uh, in the fall. Uh, but most of the time, it's just a ghost town and there's nobody there but just trekkers like us. We also climb Kalapatar. Kalapatar, again, I say climb, but it's really just a walk up. Non-technical is this big mound of rock and dirt right here. 18,000 feet high. You can see the trail here. Actually, this isn't the summit, but it actually the trail goes behind and uh, the trail continues up this direction. Uh, until you reach the, the top. Just below the top, there's a kind of a, a jumbled area of rocks and everything. Yeah, you might have to use your hands a little bit, but uh, not technical. And the reason why we climb that is for the views of Mount Everest. From base camp, uh, you can't see Mount Everest because of the west shoulder of Everest kind of blocks the view. So typically after we get to Gorik Shep, uh, we get settled into our lodge rooms, we get some food, we hydrate, get some hot fluids, fluids and meal in us, uh, some foods. And, uh, and then make our way to Everest Base Camp, hang out there as long as we want before making our way back. And then we can, uh, the next day before we head back down, climb Kalapatar, but it's completely fluid. So it depends, you know, everybody doesn't have to do the exact same thing. So if people are not so much into going to base camp, but they really want to climb Kalapatar, we can make that happen. They can rest for one day and then before making that climb. If they're not so much into climbing Kalapatar, but their big goal is to make it a base camp, rest that first day. The second day we can go to base camp. So it's completely customizable, depend on uh, who we have with the trip and how people are feeling. Uh, this is looking towards the top of Kalapatar. Great view that... Uh, of the summit, actually, um, there's a beautiful slab of rock that juts out towards Pomori, the very, very uh, summit, extremely exposed. People got to be very careful when getting up there, getting their pictures for Instagram or Facebook, whatever it may be, or their TikToks. Uh, that's Pomori sitting behind at 23,000 feet, um, the sister peak of Mount Everest. And that's the view. That's why we're climbing 
Kalapatar. Again, you can't see at Mount Everest from base camp. So that's why we like to um, go up to Kalapatar and see the view. Looking down on Everest base camp, all down here, you can see the Kumbu Glacier and the Kumbu Icefall, which is that first big major um, hazard for climbers on Everest is climbing through this area which here, which is extremely dangerous. But in the springtime, this whole swath of snow and glacial ice right here is littered and littered with uh, hundreds and hundreds of tents, like it is right now. Right now is the climbing season. And uh, so there's, last I heard, there was like 300 and some uh, climbing permits were issued. So this whole area down here is a huge area. And uh, there's there'd be yellow dots of, uh, you know, tents and everything all along this area right here. Uh, and again, west shoulder of Everest here, the ridge line is the border between uh, Nepal and Tibet. And this is peak over here to the left or right of Everest is uh, Nupsi. Looks like it's bigger than Everest, but it's actually just in the foreground. So it gives that illusion that it's a larger peak. And zooming in a little bit, again, Everest, the west shoulder of Everest and uh, Nupsi to the right. Some happy truckers. Some of my favorite gals uh, went with me a few years back uh, from the Minneapolis area, met them in, uh, at the expo. Maybe some are, of them are on here right now, I'm not sure. But uh, behind them, uh, this is on the trip into base camp. Again, that's the, uh, the uh, lateral moraine of the Kumbu Glacier. So again, two to three hours to get to base camp. If you're taking your time, about three hours. Uh, it's a pretty mild hike. You're going from 17,000 feet at Gorak Shep up to 17,500, so not a lot of elevation gain. And uh, you walk along the lateral moraine of the Kumbu Glacier, finally drop down onto the glacier itself, making your way to Everest Base Camp. Base Camp, again, is such a huge area that they distinguish one spot, like you can see here, as being base camp. That way, people have a spot to go to to get their photos taken and things like that, so they're not meandering all over the place, because again, it's just such a huge area. So like you can see here, they'll spray paint on it or something, uh, Everest Base Camp, and have the prayer flag so that uh, people can have that place of celebration and accomplishment uh, at Everest Base Camp. From that point, it's on our way back down. So it's quick. It's, uh, you know, it's about uh, 12 days uh, heading up to base camp and about half of that to get back down. So we've been taking our time acclimating on our way up. Now our bodies are full with uh, red blood cells and we're heading back down. So it's cruise time. So heading back down, uh, we pass through the climbers memorials. A lot of time up the standard route, we pass through the climbers memorials on our way up. Uh, but if you go to the high passes, you're going to go through the climbers memorials uh, on the way down. A beautiful, beautiful area. You can see all these different uh, memorials of different uh, sizes and shapes. And some are made of rock. Some are made of like kind of concrete. Um, all to uh, all memorials for different climbers in the area. If you have read Into Thin Air and you're into that um, that story of the great disaster on Everest in 1996. Uh, right over here and onto the left of the screen is Scott Fisher's memorial. It's quite a large memorial. It has his name on it and the dates and everything. Scott Fisher was one of the guides, uh, Western guides that died on Mount Everest in 1996 when a storm unexpectedly whirled in. Great book. If you haven't read it, um, highly recommend it. And we passed through Tang Boucher, a small village that's uh, on the way back down, uh, about 12,000 feet high. It's basically a small village that's built around uh, a Buddhist monastery. It's a working Buddhist monastery. It has about uh, 50 monks that uh, reside there and practice Buddhism there. Uh, it's a nice, quiet um, village right down here towards the end is a awesome bakery. So it's a great place to spend a little bit of time at. There's uh, from the ridge line. I took this photo looking down onto the village, uh, and that's the monastery there. Um, and about three o'clock in the afternoon, they open up the doors for visitors uh, to watch the monks and and listen to them do their chanting and their reading of their uh, their Buddhist scriptures. About uh, two thirty or so, three o'clock. A couple of monks uh, open up these windows up here and they blow a large conch shell. Yes, a conch shell from the ocean that's nowhere near them, but was at some point, I suppose. Uh, blow that to just let the monks know that it's time for prayers uh, and 
to come back into the monastery. Sometimes they'll be out playing soccer. Sometimes they'll be out playing volleyball in the fields close by. So it's quite fun to see them in their element away from uh, what we envision them as, as just Buddhist monks. They like to have fun as well. This is a photo of inside that monastery, the Teng Buche Monastery. Again, they open up their doors uh, to people so that you can experience it. You don't have to be Buddhist to really um, appreciate the beauty and the spirituality of uh, the monastery and the Buddhist uh, religion, but it's just incredible to sit and watch them as they're cross-legged here, sitting there, drink, sipping their tea between scriptures that they read. It's, it's just an incredible experience. And just a quick photo, I took the Mount Everest um, from Tang Bouche. It was literally at this time the clouds were completely filled, the skies were filled with clouds and this little tiny natural frame or window opened up a Mount Everest and I took that quick po uh, picture. Again, everything is carried up on the back of somebody or an animal. Here's your typical Home Depot lumber package uh, being carried up on the backs of porters. Yes, those are four by eight sheets of plywood and there's probably four or five sheets per person there. So that's all being carried up for uh, the building of a lodge or uh, some sort of structure. One of our last views of Mount Everest there to the left that you can see peeking over the Lhotse Nipsi wall. Uh, this uh, Buddhist stupa here is a monument for um, Tenzing Norgay, uh, the famous Sherpa climber that summited Everest with Sir Edmund Hillary uh, in 1953. Uh, and you can also see some uh, Zokyos. I mentioned Zokyos briefly before. That's a crossbreed between a yak and a cow, very efficient animals. Uh, you see uh, yaks really only above 11,000 feet, but the Zokios can travel all the way down to Kathmandu, if you will, all the way up to base camp. So uh, yaks, not so efficient. Uh, they'll overheat at the lower elevations. So you see quite a few of Zokios that can uh, carry things um, at all elevations. Starting to see a lot more horses or mules. I don't know really the difference myself, but these could be horses or mules. This is back in Lukla. Uh, again, uh, we'll stay one night here before um, we catch our flight the next day back to Kathmandu. Lots of shopping here, lots of great restaurants, uh, internet cafes. They do a great uh, job of um, having these coffee bars that you can uh, use their Wi-Fi and, and update your Facebook and Instagrams and stuff like that and just have a great cup of coffee. Really cool furniture. It's like wicker furniture and it's just a great place to relax and and think about the trip that we just had. Uh, again, back in Lukla, uh, this is a group from just a few years ago, fantastic group of people. And I just love the smiles on everybody's faces. And, uh, and here's uh, another uh, snapshot of the airport before flying back to um, Kathmandu. We spent a couple of days in Kathmandu before flying home. Again, unless people are gonna extend their, their stay um, in Nepal and explore other regions. Um, so we spend a half day sightseeing trip, uh, exploring a few of the different more popular uh, UNESCO sites, um, or popular sites to go and, and uh, that you see me on National, Geogra National Geographic Discovery Channels, things like this. So this is uh, Swambunath, also known as the Monkey Temple, uh, Buddhist uh, stupa with the prayer flags, uh, prayer wheels that surround it completely. Lots and lots of monkeys for its namesake, of course, all over the place. A lot of fun to watch and you don't get to get up close and personal with monkeys too often. So it's always a lot of fun taking pictures of them. Uh, this is in Durbar Square, uh, about a 20 minute walk from the hotel that we stay at in Kathmandu. Again, a great place to hang out, walk and explore. It's kind of a, a locals area. You don't see, you do see lots of tourists. Um, uh, and that's why they set up uh, areas like this where you can buy different crafts, um, knickknacks. I mean, gosh, just about everything you can imagine um, for uh, friends and family back home. And this is like um, small pieces of slate, very thin slate that they hand carve uh, different um, mostly Buddhist um, like sayings, uh, pictures, uh, the eyes of Buddha as well. Another spot we stop out at is Bodhinath. This is the largest stupa in Nepal. And uh, you can see that um, the stupa there in the center, it's surrounded by, again, lots of shops um, and restaurants. We spend uh, a good portion of the day here, typically have lunch there as well. Um, and it's a great place to relax and hang out. This uh, particular stupa was uh, damaged 
in the big earthquake in 2015. Uh, this has been since uh, rebuilt, and you can, this is the the uh, the new version of it after the reconstruction of it, which they did a great job of doing, and they've uh, made a huge comeback since that earthquake in 2015. It's been great to see them rebound from that so quickly. That's just another shot of the shops and restaurants in in Bodanath. And then people just head home, unless if you're uh, extending your stay. So um, I hope I haven't rambled on too terribly long. I think we have a few minutes. If there happens to be any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your time with me. I appreciate you spending time with me. I know we're all busy, and uh, and I hope you have a great evening. Again, this is my 19th year traveling to Nepal, and next year is the big one, 20 years of traveling and uh, guiding in Nepal. And, uh, and I'm planning on having a big trek uh, next year with maybe a climb involved too. Nothing too crazy, but we're trying to put that together. So if you're interested next year, um, get a hold of me and uh, either on Facebook or trekwithsteve at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions after the fact, uh, again, send them uh, via Facebook on Trek with Steve, hit my like. Uh, or send me an email and I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you may have. I can talk and talk and talk about it all day long, but uh, I'm going to let you go. So uh, thanks again for attending and joining me. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hey, Stephen. Stephen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Great, great job. Um, I was, Thank you. Um, I got to say those images uh really well like technically really well shot i, I have a <laughs> i have a, a photography background and uh, really great shots i loved um someone just mentioned here great presentation thank you perhaps a trek to base camp is now in my bucket list <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um another one says great talk steve um i love the shot of the of the um sort of the, the the monuments of the, the the fallen climbers and stuff such a powerful image i love yeah. how a lot of the photos just really showed a lot of the you know going to a place any place in the mountains it's hard to capture mountains and trying to kind of show the scale of yes things. and i i think you i don't know who's taking the photos but whoever did those are, all mine. <laughs> those are wonder wonderful photos i think they really show the scale and um uh, a nice uh honest look at the culture and and sort of the obviously the landscape um someone says here um the pics brought back so many great memories of our trek maybe i can join you next year i'm not sure who that was but um maybe a previous client or something that's cool yeah absolutely awesome um this has definitely been on my bucket list personally for a long time i don't know that i'll get there in the next decade or so maybe once my little one's a little <laughs> bit older but maybe, maybe they'll be able to join you just got to put it on the calendar whether right. it's a that year away so true. two years you just got to put it on the calendar that's right put it on the calendar and you know find figure out a way to budget for it and and yep. etc i think that you bring up a good point uh you probably mentioned it a couple times where you know the, uh, going to a place like this or other similar places around the world that you kind of owe it to yourself to to you know you spend all this time budgeting and prepping that you should take if you can take uh, as much time as you can while you're there to really take it all in and you know nowadays with um pandemic and other uh situations um internationally um, you might get stuck there for a little bit yeah, <laughs> you might you know things, things get delayed all the time you know i mean it's happened <laughs> yeah roads roads fall away new roads have to get built a truck breaks down etc so you know yeah, you they'll, kind of, they'll close down local in a heartbeat you know I'm sure they, yeah those clouds yeah. moved in or yeah it's there's <laughs> been people that have been stuck there for days and days so <laughs> it, it can happen uh look at it says here love steve's presentation reminded me of the trek i took with steve several years ago looking looking to go on another trek with steve soon thanks steve i'm not sure who that awesome. is but <laughs> that's great that's awesome. well, with that being said i just want to say thanks uh even for all your your, your uh, partnership with the expo over the last year, several years, I look forward to many more presentations with you. Yes. Um, thanks for all your 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 all your information and uh, willingness to share it all. It's, it really means a lot, especially now in in a pandemic where maybe we all can't be under that big hot warm tent outside the Midwest Mountaineering. <laughs> um just want to put in a final plug for the shop we're open. Um, we're running the expo through Sunday, May second. Everything on the store is on sale. Uh, we have a lot of expert staff here help uh, to help you with uh, helping with gear choices or uh, trip advice or connecting you with uh, people like Steven or other presenters that we have. 
Lots more presentations coming up down the pipeline. Be sure to check out the schedule on the outdooradventureexpo.com site. And just a reminder, all these presentations are being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube page uh, within about 48 hours or so. So um, if you missed anything, you can definitely uh, rewatch them there. And with that being said, I will say good night and we will uh, see you all tomorrow for a whole new round of presentations. Thank you, Stephen. Awesome. Thanks, Adana. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye. All right. You too.